Hello, my name is Haley Doggett, and today I'll be talking to you a little bit about the Life Vest. Now, when most of you hear the word Life Vest, you may think of the type of Life Vest that's used as a flotation device, but that is not actually the type of Life Vest I want to talk to you about today. Actually, I would like to talk about the Zoll Life Vest. It is a wearable defibrillator for patients at high risk for sudden cardiac arrest who are not yet candidates for internal defibrillators, which are also known as ICDs. This right here is an example of the Zoll Life Vest that's currently used. It is worn over the shoulders, much like a backpack would be worn. It has the uh, self-gelling defibrillator pad seen in the back. It has a garment belt worn uh, above the waist around where the apex of the heart lies. It in-houses the ECG electrodes, which are responsible for monitoring heart rate and rhythms. It also has a monitor, which is the black box there, which um, stores the data that's collected by the electrodes and can be later transferred to the LifeVest network and later reviewed by physicians. A little bit of history about the Zoll LifeVest. In 1986, Dr. N. Stephen Heilman and his group of colleagues founded LifeCore and began the development of wearable cardiac defibrillators. The device was tested for three years in the U.S. and Europe and later approved by the FDA. LifeVest is now a company that bought out LifeCore and they developed their own devices. So in 2002, the FDA approved the LifeVest wearable cardioverter defibrillator. And since then, LifeVest has developed four generations of wearable cardiac devices. So a lot of you may wonder, what really is the purpose of a LifeVest? If you're having a sudden cardiac arrest, which is also known as SCA, if you simply call an ambulance and get transported to the hospital, your chances of surviving are only 6.4%. If you have a, a physician standing by at the time your uh, cardiac arrest occurs, your chances of surviving are only 15 to 20%. And you actually have better luck just by being pure lucky, which you have a 75% chance of surviving. So a life vest is not a bad thing to necessarily have around. What exactly does the life vest do? Well, it's the device that monitors your heart rhythms, which will be things like ventricular fibrillation, which is a severe abnormal heart rhythm, or ventricular tachycardia, which is a rapid heart rate. It can detect and treat sudden cardiac arrest in less than 60 seconds, and it'll provide a shock if deadly arrhythmia is present. So pretty much your heart is not only a muscle that pumps blood to your body, it is an electrical system as well. It's made up of like SA and AV nodes. They'll send impulses down the heart, which send signals to contract the heart muscles, which in turn pump the blood and push it out of your heart and through your body to your organs. So if your body's not being supplied enough um, blood, it's not gonna reach your brain. Patients will begin to feel lightheaded and can become unconscious. So this is what the life vest does. It's gonna send alarms to alert the patient so that they know that something's going on that's not right with their heart. Some of the features of the uh, Life Vest, it's a lightweight monitor, it's only 1.8 pounds, has non-gel, non-adhesive ECG electrodes, self-gelling defibrillation electrodes, the conscious test before shock, which is what I mentioned, it's an alarm, set of alarms sounding, letting the patient know that something's wrong, there's a response button located on the monitor that they need to press if they are conscious to deactivate the shock system. And if they don't, then the shock will initiate. It monitors heart rhythms for 30 seconds before initiating the shock, and the monitor can store up to 75 minutes of ECG data. Now, the treatment sequence for the life vest, if an arrhythmia is detected, it's going to monitor it for 30 seconds. At this point, during the entire 30 seconds, a vibration alarm will sound, alerting the patient that something's wrong. After five seconds, a siren's gonna also alert the patient, giving them another opportunity to, to uh, hit the response button. If the device is still not deactivated by hitting the response button, a louder siren will occur after about 10 seconds. At this point, if the patient hasn't hit the response button, they're probably unconscious and so the device will then send a bystander warning, letting any surrounding people know that they need to step back because the shock is about to be initiated. The gel will start releasing in the defibrillator pads, 
which is used to help protect the skin from burns that can occur during the shock, and it also helps transfer the electricity from the device through the patient's body. Now, the actual shock treatment occurs after 25 seconds. If a, the patient does not still respond after the first shock, the device will continue to shock the patient until they hear a response, until the patient can get up and actually hit the response button. So the device's main purpose is to get the heart back into a regular rhythm that can, so it prevents any further damage. Physicians are capable of reviewing the ECG strips. They can monitor how often the patient is wearing the device and if the patient is experiencing any difficulties with the device, such as loose electrodes or malfunctioning equipment. Just by um, the device, the information that's stored in the monitor, it can be updated on the LifeVest network, and this is where the patients pretty much, um, I'm sorry, the physicians access the information of the patient's LifeVest. How they go about doing this, the physician logs on to the LifeVest company network. They'll have a list of patients uh, that are their active wearers. They'll choose their patient from the list. And it'll bring up all their EKG strips. It'll show the activity of their heart how often the patient's been wearing the device and if they're having any complications or problems with the vest at the time. Uh, the network can be accessed anywhere that there's internet capable devices. So anywhere that there's a laptop or a smartphone, the physician is capable of accessing the patient's data that's regarded with the life vest. As far as insurance coverage, life vest is covered by most health plans in the U.S. Of course, there are qualifying conditions. Uh, some of the examples of those are gonna be after a recent heart attack, before and after heart bypass surgery, uh, patients who are listed for cardiac transplant, and those with terminal disease with life expectancy of less than one year. So if you fall under any of those categories, your insurance most likely will cover the cost of life vest, but you still will be responsible for a copay, however. Once orders have been given for a patient to have a life vest, they will get fitted and then it's really up to the patient to take care of it from there. So some of the responsibilities that lie on the patient are gonna be the changing of the battery, which is done every 24 hours. They get two rechargeable batteries, so there's always one in the system and one always charging. Absolutely in no way can they get the system wet. They are to wear the vest at all times, so it will need to be uh, taken off during showering, but other than that, the life vest should be worn all the time. Only patients should hold response buttons when feeling the vibration or hearing siren alarm. This is mainly because if the patient is unresponsive, unresponsive, the vest is going to need to give a shock to get their heart rate back in rhythm. Now, a family member standing by that presses the response button when they're unconscious is not gonna help them at all because the vest is not gonna shock them. It's not gonna initiate that response and it's not going to get the heart back in a normal rhythm, and the patient could possibly die. So only the patient should hold the response button if they're conscious to do so. Uh, the device also sends uh, data through a modem. Now these are older devices, so it's the patient's responsibility to hook up the modem and their monitor to transfer the, the uh, excuse me, the data that was collected. So this is done once per week. Now in newer devices, the patient data is updated every three days wirelessly from the device to the network itself. So the patient doesn't really have to do anything. So that's good, they don't have to constantly remember, oh, I have to hook up my device to the modem to transfer my data. So that's definitely one of the improvements they've made over the years. As far as the older devices, they were a lot larger and more bulky. Voice recordings initiated the entire process, and like I said, the modem connection was required for data transfer. Uh, as for present devices, which is the one pictured you saw earlier, it's a lot smaller and user-friendly. Uh, the device has a touchscreen monitor, and it uses wireless transfer of data to the network. As far as future devices go, I actually spoke with one of the Zoll LifeVest representatives and he said that they continue to improve in size, usability, and comfort for patients. Uh, one of the main complaints of patients is that they're just not comfortable since they have to sleep in them. So they're really doing more research trying to work on getting the devices more comfortable in that aspect. So 
that in a nutshell is pretty much everything about the Zoll Life Vest. If you're more interested, here are my resources that I use for my research. And I thank you so much for your time.